Okay, here we go, y'all. Um, this is gonna be an exciting interview. Sitting down, this is a fascinating figure right here. Uh, how do I describe him? P I M P. Um, founder of the hip hop fraternity, author, filmmaker. Please welcome my brother, Pimpin' Ken. Ken, what up? Thank you for having me, brother. It's an interesting platform. I I, I like the introduction. You you one of the few people that put commas on my on my lifestyle. <laughs> Most people say <laughs> Pimpin' Ken. Period. <laughs> Nah, nah, you 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 gotta put them commas where they belong. Like, like I understand the difference between a comma and a period. You you don't wore so many hats across the board, man. I, I would be doing you a disservice if I didn't include them commas. Mm-hmm. Thank you. My brother. Yeah, you know, and I want you got such a fascinating story. And I want to go back to the beginning and then bring it current. Is that cool with you? Yeah, that's what's up. My brother. Okay, where'd you grow up, Ken? It was the Midwest, correct? Yeah, I was born in Chicago. You know, uh, uh, when I was around 14, I kind of caught a murder, attempted murder case. And, uh, you know, I was in the Cook County Jail, one of the youngest uh, inmates in there, me and my brother. And then we eventually beat that charge and went to Milwaukee. And uh, we moved to Milwaukee to get away from Chicago. We ended up going to jail there for uh, forgery, for check cashing. And so uh, a portion of my younger years, I spent in, in and out of reformatory school. And then, you know, uh, in one of those uh, situations in the, in the midst of that, I met a, a partner, a friend of mine who, who, who got into the pimp gang. He had a girl, he had three girls. One of them name was Dirty Red. And I said, man, you got three bitches. Let me have one of them. He said, which one you want? I said, I want the one that's light bright with pussy candy stripe. They ended up giving me the yellow chick. Her name was Dirty Red. And that's how my career in the game, that's how, you know, the pimping thing began. But, you know, of course, you know, I was young and I was a hustler. So I kept on, you know, doing crazy shit like robbing banks and, you know, robbing jewelry stores and shit like that, you know. So I had a little gangster in me. So I, I never really talked to the pimping like fish take the water until after, you know, I eventually got out of jail. And when I got out of jail, you know, I said, man, I think this is something I want to do because I met a couple of guys in there who had had experience and they had gave me some, some games, some tips on the game. So that inspired me to want to go out there and be in the game. And then, you know, of course, you know, uh, you know, after that, you know, I got a little, took a couple of college courses when I went to prison again, you know, and uh, I uh, 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 took some business courses. So I came out, you know, initially I started hustling, selling dope. You know, that shit didn't work for me. You know, I, I didn't like dealing with dope things, you know. It's just like somebody playing me out my money was just crazy, you know. So uh, that didn't work for me. So I ended up getting deep, knee deep in the game. And I became a legendary pimp. I became Pimp Ken. You know, went to New York, went to Cali, you know, went to D.C., went to all the tracks around the world and built a name for myself. And then um, around 95, I went to a play the ball with the Bishop Don Magic Wand. That's when I met Ice T, who's my dear friend and business partner today. And from that situation, the next year, 96, HBO came uh, to Chicago. I eventually brought him over to Milwaukee and struck a, a, a lucrative deal with them. And the, the film Pimps Up, Hold Down was created. Thereafter, the Hughes brothers got in contact with me. Then America Pimp was created. You know, So uh, that began my... Uh, my taste of business. And at that point, I became a consummate businessman, you know, and I just created my own project uh, called Pepology. And I did Best of Both Worlds. I did uh, Ghetto Suites, Executive Suites. You know, I did several independent projects. And then that eventually led me to doing uh, uh, features on album. The first album I featured with Jermaine Dupri that sold 2 million. And I went to Lil John. We sold about 8 million with Lil John. I did two songs for Too Short, that sold a few million. Then I did five albums for Pimp C, five with Pastor Choi. I did uh, songs with Mac 10, you know, 50 Cent. You know, everybody in the industry did work with Puffy and Loom and Nelly. And, you know, that created the mystique of, you know, the the the, uh, the intro outro man, you know, the, uh, right. the, the awkward hip hop. And then from there, you know, uh, I got into real estate, I got into daycares, I became a multimillionaire, bought uh, a mansion in the suburbs, 
raised my kids in the suburbs, you know, sent them all to college and shit, you know, changed my life. And uh, one of my sons, he's on that All American uh, 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 pro uh, film thing. He's done a few films. He's he's very uh, doing very well in California. And then uh, so after that, Pimp C died. When Pimp C died, it kind of hurt my heart. So I kind of backed away from the industry for a minute. And then you know I thought about all the things that Pimp C wanted to do and the stuff we talked about by unifying hip hop. You know I know you heard him talk about that before. So I called Ice T, and Ice T was telling me about the rap syndicate, you know, and about, you know, uh, the Zulu Nation and how, you know, they was doing things back in the day. I said, man, I got an idea. I'm gonna start the hip hop fraternity, and it's gonna be an organization of bosses, you know, and each city gonna have their own boss, and we're gonna form it like the United States, you know, each state gonna be a governor in that state from the hip hop fraternity, and the uh, White House would be in Atlanta, which is the Black House, and we would call it you know, uh, the headquarters, and we call it Hip Hop Fraternity, and each uh, a member of that organization would be a licensee. They'd be a DBA doing business as, but they had their own 501C, 50, uh, uh, LLC or 501C3, you know, independent, uh, you know, nonprofit. nonprofit. Yeah, nonprofit. You know member. something, even before we go too deep, because I want to dig deep into, into the Hip Hop Fraternity, but can we go backwards for a second? Yeah. You just gave us a ton to un unpack in a few minutes. So I want to I take this story a little slower because my brother, did, did you like, to you, this is just your life. But you just gave us so much in such a short amount of time that I'll be doing the audience a disservice if we didn't take this thing slow, okay? No, I'm just, I, I know we was going to cover. I was just, you know, it was like an introduction, that's all. <laughs> my brother. Okay, um, so you said you got locked up at what, 14 years old on tip murder charge? Yeah. And that was with your blood brother? Yeah, my blood, my oldest brother, Kali. Okay, so number one, if you don't mind, what happened? What landed y'all in that situation? And then how'd y'all even beat it? Well, because uh, in Chicago, you have uh, what they call L trains, right? And the third rail is electrifying, you know, it can kill you if you touch it, you know. So it was this white drunk guy, we was in Oak Park, Illinois, and uh, he kind of, you know, approached my brother on some gangster shit, you know, on some nigga shit, because back then they'd call you niggas back then, you know, and my brother pushed him, you know, because he was approaching. So when he pushed him, he was so drunk, he stumbled onto the, to the uh, you know, to the tracks. Fortunately, the train wasn't coming. So he got back up and got on the tracks, but it was a camera there and it was some white, other white people there who called the police and said that we did all this stuff to him. So the police, they uh, took us to the headquarters. They beat us down, they stomped us. And we were trying to tell them that we was underage and they was they weren't trying to listen to us. You know what I'm saying? So they sent us straight to the, to the adult jail. Now, we being scared of my father and not want to, you know, convey, you know, who we really was and, you know, stuff like that. My brother just said, man, let's just go with what they, what they going with. And maybe they might let us out if we say that we adults and maybe daddy don't have to get us so we can get out. So we lied about our age, you know what I'm saying? Me and by us lying about our age, that put us in an adult uh, facility with nothing but gang bangers, GDs, vice lords, Latin kings, Spanish cobras, you know, it was the worst jail I've ever been in my life. But we had a, 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 a a decision to make, do we tell these people who we really are, do we go home and daddy beat us with the stension cord, which is how he used to whoop us. Yeah, so we were more afraid of pops than we was of uh, being in there with them gangsters and killers. You know, we was like, anything is better than me, pops, you know? So we know what pops gonna do. You know, we had to work our way through that. You know, being that my father was a player and he gave, he laced us with gang. You know, a lot of the guys respect us because they didn't know we was, we were so shy to be young dudes. You know, we had a lot of gang. All my uncles and all of them, you know, we grew up around gang. All my whole family was players, you know. So uh, that kind of went through that. And so what happened was the judge, you know, when he was, uh, when we was going to uh, one of our, our hearings, he was saying like, okay, he's asking the prosecutor, did they intentionally push them over there? Did it, was it intentional? Was it, was it a, 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 a purpose act? And so, uh, the, the, the district attorney said, no, uh, it looked like 
uh, the uh, the person, you know, who who who's making the charges, it seemed like he approached them first, and so the judge said, you know, uh, this is not gonna fly. You know, we you know we might as well dismiss the case. So they did a no process. They didn't dismiss it. They did a no process, meaning that they could bring it up at any time. But you know, we was minor, so we left. And you know, if they even if they would have called us, you know, it would have came up in the system, you know, that they were legally liable, you know. So I guess that's probably why they just didn't pursue it. They probably found out who we really was and found out that we was, we was underage. What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love. Make every move a power move. And I'll catch you all on the next video.